Good evening, and welcome to the third Dunham Bible Museum lecture. And we've had two others, which very soon will be on our website for you to listen to if you happen to have missed those. One of the aims of the lecture series and the Dunham Bible Museum is to help provide history, background uh, for the Bible. How did the Bible come to be? How has it come to us in the current condition that we have it? And we are very privileged to have with us this evening Dr. Donald Brake, Vice President and Dean of Multnomah Seminary and a gentleman who is most able to help us understand the background of both the Greek uh, text behind the New Testament as well as the history of our English Bibles. Dr. Brake did his undergraduate work at Cedarville College and received his master's and PhD from Dallas Seminary. After graduating from seminary, he was a missionary along with his wife and family to Ethiopia for two terms. Um, but the uh, coup against Halle Selassie and the installation of the communist government uh, caused them to have to leave the country. And then from 1990 to 93, Dr. Brake, um, he went to Multnomah Seminary, excuse me, went to Multnomah uh, teaching and dean of the seminary. Then he had a brief respite from 90 to 93 as president of the Jerusalem University College, which used to be the Institute of Holy Land Studies. He served as a pastor in Carrollton, Texas, and then returned to Multnomah. Dr. Brake is a collection of rare manuscripts, Bibles, some of which are illustrated in this brand new book that has just come out, A Visual History of the English Bible, that you can purchase from the Bible Museum or online. And it's a beautifully illustrated book that tells you about the history of the English Bible and part of Dr. Brake's collection, and he's going to share some of that information with us tonight. Thank you for coming, Dr. Brake. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I'm never quite sure in addressing an audience like this. Uh, some of you have a great deal of experience and knowledge in the area of the English Bible and the text behind it, and others of you may not know very much about it. So in some cases, I may bore you if you know too much, and in some cases, I may be over your head if you don't know enough. So I'll try to match something in between. Uh, I always like to tell a few stories now and again. I uh, hope you uh, will uh, forgive me for any kind of story that uh, I might tell. In fact, uh, I think I'll begin with one. Uh, it was true that uh, during the uh, uh, uprising in uh, Ethiopia, when Haile Selassie was deposed and the Chinese communists took control, uh, I was teaching in a Bible school uh, down country, and uh, we had, were under a lot of pressure for about three or four uh, months uh, just prior to his coup and then several months after that. And so finally they forced us all into the capital city and there was just not enough work for everybody in the capital city and so at that time uh, we came home. But one of the things during those uh, trying months, I was in charge of the bookstore and the library and the school and so uh, in order to uh, get prepared to leave we had to evacuate everything. We were only allowed to uh, leave the country with what we could carry in our suitcase. And so I had lots of books and, and Bibles and things that I had to get rid of. So I had a great big sale for all the Ethiopians. Well, they don't have much money, so you can imagine they were all sold fairly cheaply. And I remember one of the uh, Bible school teachers came up to me and said, I want to buy five of these particular uh, Amharic Bibles. That's the language uh, in Ethiopia. And I said, why in the world do you want five uh, you have one for you and your wife, and your three children are all, they were all like infants. They were pre-six uh, six, uh, six years old. And he said, well, you know, I'm going to take those Bibles, and I'm going to bury them, because we believe that once the communists get control, that they're going to destroy all of the Bibles. And so he bought these, wrapped them in plastic, and uh, buried them. I have never heard what happened to those since then. But that stuck with me when I came back to the States and began to teach at Multnomah. And one of my subjects was uh, the history of the Bible and canonicity and some of those things. And that rang in my mind so much because I realized the desire on the part of the Ethiopians to know God's word and to study the Bible. And there's a lot of apathy in America. 
and I could even tell that at a Bible college uh, where they didn't seem to have that passion for the Bible that they did have in Ethiopia. So as I began to teach and to uh, talk about these things, I began to realize I would like to have an understanding of the history of how we got our Bible. And I remember one day uh, while I was uh, uh, sitting in, in, the, uh, in my office, I received a list of Bibles from a dealer in, in England, and he listed on there two Bibles. Uh, and I, so I took them to a colleague of mine, and I said, uh, what should I do with this? I said they were, I like three or $400 each, and I said, you know, I don't necessarily have the money for these, but what, what should I do? And of course, he wasn't going to spend his money. So he said, oh, you should buy them. He said, they'll give you good talking, po talking points in your class. And so I, uh, I bought one, which was a Geneva Bible. Uh, it was a 15, uh, a bit, I believe it was 1596. And the other was a Bishop's Bible of 1569. So I ordered both of these Bibles, paid for them, and waited and waited and waited for them to arrive. Well, finally they arrived. And sure enough, as I got them, I took them with my, with my colleague. We went over to his basement, went downstairs. And his name was Dr. Goodrick, and he's the one that did the, uh, the NIV concordance. And uh, so he was uh, used to a lot of detail and translations, so we started pouring over these two Bibles. Well, much to my surprise, the 1569 Bishop's Bible was not a Bishop's Bible, but a great Bible. And it was, in fact, it was the very last great Bible ever produced. The great Bible, uh, the first edition of that was done in 1539. This was 1569, and the prayer book and the Psalms from that book continued on into the Bishop's Bible and some of the other editions later, so I found that I had a real treasure, and so I thought, boy, I've got this book dealer. I've got this book, which is much more valuable than the Bishop's, and yet I only had to pay for the Bishop's price, so I'm thinking I'm very, very smart, you see. Well, maybe he did that on purpose because I bought hundreds and hundreds of things from him over the years, and he got all the money he lost on that first deal he got back from me. But that created an interest in me to begin to collect Bibles because I wanted to trace the Bible from the time it was given, and especially in the New Testament, all the way up to the time, that the translation that we have in our hands today. And we saw even a new one today, uh, which is called the uh, voice, yeah, the voice. Uh, and it's a brand new one. So they've gone all of these translations for all these years, and I thought, you know, I want to know what that's all about. So I was hooked, and so I began to uh, collect, and then, of course, it wasn't long before I had a copy of each one of the various Bibles uh, up through the uh, 17th century, and then I thought, well, you know, I really need to have the Greek New Testaments, and so I began to collect Greek New Testaments, and the very first one I got was a 1546 first edition Stephanus, which had this, uh, which belonged to G. Gresham Machen and Ned B. Stonehouse, who are famous uh, theologians and Greek scholars. And I thought I had another treasure, and I do uh, have a great treasure, and I prize it. So I began to collect Greek New Testament. So it became a passion of mine to try to determine the Greek texts that were under all these various translations that were going, uh, that were being made. And so I've spent a, a number of years working on those. So that's sort of what I want to talk about this evening, though I could talk about the ancient manuscripts beginning with the first century all the way up to the period of printing, but I've decided to set that aside and talk mostly about printed Greek New Testaments, and that's what I have uh, dealt with most uh, since I've been collecting, although I have quite a few uh, uh, papyrus fragments and uh, manuscript leaves and things like that from earlier periods uh, before printing. Uh, really, my passion is for printed texts, which happened, uh, which began in 1516. So I just want to share a little bit with you uh, concerning the Greek text that is behind the English versions, and especially the earlier English versions. Uh, we could go on and on for a very long time if we talked about all of them. So I'll try to give you a summary of some of those. When Time Magazine named Johann, Johann Gutenberg as the man of the year in 1999, it was because of that magnificent discovery of his, which was movable type. He did not discover the printing press. He discovered movable type. And the very fact that he printed the very first book, at least the very first complete book, was a Bible makes it the most valuable book in the world. Uh, it sells for millions of dollars if you were to find one that was for sale. And so uh, the Gutenberg Bible began a process which was extremely important 
because now you could produce mass quantities of books uh, without mistakes, quote, without mistakes. What we find is that once you get a mistake in a printing press, it'll produce that same mistake over and over again. But at least the concept was there and the possibility was there that you could get more books faster with fewer errors. And so the Gutenberg press and the movable type uh, was extremely important in this early period. And so uh, Johann Gutenberg was considered to be the man of the millennium because of that. It really was because of the press that we got the Renaissance and the Reformation, all because now we could have books that knowledge could be spread from community to community with much more ease than the slow handwritten copies that they were doing before that. So the press was extremely important. Uh, the press was, uh, the Gutenberg Bible was somewhere around 1455, 1456. Uh, that could vary a little bit, but that's usually the dates that are placed with the press. That coincides with another very important event, and that was the fall of Constantinople. Uh, when the Turks took over Constantinople in 1453, the Greek scholars fled from uh, Constantinople, where the, where the major language of that area was Greek, and they fled to Europe. And now for the first time, well, not really the first time, but uh, at least now, almost all of the major universities began to teach Greek. Up to that point, most Bibles, in fact, all Bibles uh, in, in England were really in Latin until John Wycliffe in 1382 produced a, a Bible in English, but it was from the Latin. But now, after 1453, we be see the beginning of the scholarship of Greek as it comes into Europe and into England, although, like I say, there were a few institutions in Europe that did have uh, some teaching of Greek. It really began to flourish uh, a little bit later after the uh, fall of Constantinople. So the printed Greek New Testament now, uh, up till this point, everybody used the Greek text, which was all handwritten on, uh, on leather. And it was very slow to be produced. Uh, you had to learn that language uh, before you could even use it. Uh, and uh, and as, as I mentioned, most everyone uh, used the Latin Bible at that time. Now, the Bible is a, an unusual book, as I'm sure you're all aware. It claims to be the very revelation of the mind of God. And for 20 centuries, men and women of all language and races have worshipped the God that is described in the Bible. And the concept of an eternal, omnip omnipotent God communicating to the infant mortal beings can be problematic. In what language will he reveal himself to humanity? You know that communication of language from one to another is difficult enough. I mean, how many misunderstandings do you have with your friends and not your friends? Uh, as you talk back and forth, there's a lot of communication that is missed. And if you can't see me and I, you just hear my voice, you won't see expressions on my face. You won't see gestures that I make and things like that. So communication in any language is difficult. When you're communicating in a written form, it's even more difficult because you can't hear intonations, you can't get nuances of meaning. So communication of one to another in a, any language is difficult. And therefore, God communicating to simple man, it was a difficult process. And so what language would he use? Well, he chose to use Hebrew in the Old Testament, some Aramaic, and Greek of the New Testament. Now, our problem today is that we don't speak that language. So in order for us to get back to that language, we have to learn the language. And hence, we would rather have translations that put it into English so that we can understand it. So language is difficult. God is, gave to us a self-revelation of himself, and he wants us not only to have knowledge, but he wants us to have a particular emotional response to what he has to say. And in addition to the emotional response and the knowledge that he gives us, he wants us to act volitionally and act upon his precepts so that we do the things that he says in the scripture. So God in self-revelation has given us all the things that we need to live a holy and godly life. But we have to understand that, and today we do that through uh, another uh, translation because it is not our normal language. Manuscripts no longer exist that we have that came off of the pens of the writers in the early days. Uh, all of the known first edition 
if you, if you will, of the Bible are gone. Only copies of copies and perhaps copies of copies of copies of copies are all we have. Everything else has been lost. Um, so our historical perspective and our worldview is quite different than first century people. Uh, they, uh, they, religion to them was a commonplace. They understood it. Today, it's almost as if you have to learn religion uh, because it's, uh, we're living in almost a secular society and around the world it's a secular universe almost. Uh, people do not accept Christianity and religion the way they may have many years ago or even in the Middle Ages where everybody expected to be some so, have some sort of religious connection. Now we have the beginning of textual criticism uh, because the major, translation, uh, major translations today revolve around, okay, what text do we use? But that's a modern concept of textual criticism that was not early in the years uh, uh, after the printing of the, uh, uh, after the discovery of movable type. So you have really two texts today that we talk about. One is called the critical text, which is by far uh, uh, most scholars today use the critical text as the basis for their teaching and a basis for their translation. There are those who use the Textus Receptus, which is the most common uh, uh, manuscripts that we have, and yet the fewer, fewer scholars uh, hold to the uh, Textus Receptus as being the proper text today. So we began with uh, having uh, papyrus rolls. Uh, things were written originally on scrolls of papyrus or on, uh, even on book form, codex form they call them. And these papyrus rolls uh, were made out of plant, chur uh, uh, plant from the uh, Nile River. Uh, they stripped down the papyrus plant and put them in strips and then they let them dry and they could write on them. That's how the, it began. And then from then it went to leather, and from leather it went to uh, vellum, and vellum is simply a form of leather that has a treatment of acid, and that acid hardens the leather and it gives a real nice soft, a nice hard surface to write on. Uh, and those have, uh, were what we used up until the time of paper, and primarily that came uh, with the printing press, although paper was being used before that in other countries, especially in China. Uh, I think if you go through the museum, you will note uh, we have a, uh, a book over there that was made by Vince uh, Sar Sabri Savriano, I believe his name is. I, I probably have mispronounced that. But Vince, uh, several years ago, sat down and decided he was going to hand copy on papyrus exactly the way they did it in uh, the period of, uh, at least the period of the fourth century. That's the earliest book we actually have in a book form. And so he printed this out, and the museum has a copy of that, and it shows you what they would have looked like and how they would have used papyrus to write on. And that was the beginning of the text. Uh, some, some today, when they start looking at the Greek text, they say that we can get back to the, to the original autographs. Others say, no, that's impossible. Because we've missed so many, and because church the church was developing the text that there's no such thing really as a autograph, meaning the actual first written copy uh, that came off the Apostle Paul or from one of the prophets. So that's, a, that's what some say about it. Others say no. Uh, if we, by using textual criticism, we can get back to the fourth century, some say to the second century, and some will say no, we can actually get back to the text. So we can actually say once we've done textual criticism, this is actually the text that was given by God to Paul or to Luke or whoever it might be. And so that's the whole process of textual criticism. So from the Gutenberg Press up until Erasmus' first Greek New Testament, about 60 years passed. 1455 was the first Bible by, uh, printed by Gutenberg. 1516 was the first Greek New Testament that was printed. So you have about 60 years lapsed there, and you wonder, well, why in the world didn't they do a Greek New Testament before that? They did German things. They did Latin things. But it's primarily because Latin, again, was the primary Bible of Europe and England. Uh, they, they did not have uh, the Greek text and the Greek uh, scriptures uh, translated. And so 
it took a few years for all of that to change, and it did with uh, Erasmus, uh, Desiderius Erasmus of Rottingham. Uh, that was his uh, name. Uh, so when the, uh, when the uh, Greek language got into Europe, they began to translate the, the Bible uh, uh, into various languages, and Erasmus uh, started to print his own Bible. Now, he was not the first one to actually print a New Testament. It was the Complutensian Polyglot. Uh, that was the first one, which was done in about 1515, 1514, I believe it is. But it wasn't published until 1522. And Erasmus' New Testament was printed in 1516, so he beat them to the punch. Uh, and they did that probably, he did it in about a year. Erasmus himself was very interested in uh, the Greek New Testament. Uh, he probably started it even before he was contracted uh, by a printer in Basel to publish it. And uh, he began to publish it then probably in 1516 after about a year that it took him to gather the manuscripts together and to put together a script that would be uh, printable. Now, we don't know what manuscripts were used in the polyglot, the uh, Commut Complutensian polyglot. We don't know what uh, manuscripts they used, but if you've ever heard of uh, the manuscript Vaticanus, we believe that that was available from uh, Rome at that point, but there seems to be no indication that it was ever used in the Computation Polyglot, Greek New Testament. It was a massive work that has many languages in it, and it was a, it was a huge work, a beautiful work, but it didn't stick because Erasmus came along, printed a quick one in just in Greek, and it was out in 1516, long before the Complutensian Polyglot. And therefore, it was the one that really stuck. And uh, uh, most were using it. So we don't know what manuscripts they used. Some believe that uh, the, the story goes that some of the manuscripts that were used in the Polyglot were used uh, uh, for making fireworks. And so they sold them. They made them fireworks and had big displays. And so if that's true, that was probably the most expensive fireworks ever. I mean, we have some of those big things up in, in uh, Washington and Oregon, uh, the great fireworks on the 4th of July, and they spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Well, if we had the uh, manuscripts behind the uh, Complutensian Polyglot, they would be a lot more expensive than what they did uh, in Washington and Oregon. So we don't know what they used. We are a little more... Uh, we know more about what Erasmus used. He used about five Greek manuscripts uh, that were, probably came from friends and, and acquaintances and places that he knew about them. He took these Greek manuscripts, put them together, and published uh, his Greek New Testament in 1516. He published really three editions, and these are the three most important. One was 15, that was the first one, but he had a lot of errors in it. Of course, he did it in a quick period of, of a year, and so there were a lot of things he wanted to redo. So he redid one in 1519, and then he did it again in 1522. The, uh, the Erasmus New Testament of 1519 was the same one that was used by Luther in translating his German uh, New Testament. Uh, and then the one in 1522 was the one used by Tyndale in his Bible, uh, in his New Testament, uh, that he did in 1525-1526. And so these three editions of Erasmus were very important. There were some problems with what Erasmus did. Uh, it was hurriedly done. He didn't have complete manuscripts. In fact, the last portion of the book of Revela Revelation from Verses, uh, chapter 22, verses 16 through 21. He actually didn't have the Greek of, for that, and so he translated the Latin back into Greek in order to have something. Uh, he later changed that, but uh, he, in his, first, uh, in his uh, earlier editions, he, in 1522, he uh, translated it back from Latin. Also, from the Vulgate, in Acts chapter 9, 5 through 6, you'll probably recognize this if you've ever read the King James. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, and so on. This reading occurs 
uh, in the Latin, but it doesn't occur in Greek manuscripts that he used. So, it, but it does occur uh, in, in the Latin. And sure enough, uh, that occurs in Erasmus 1522 edition, and it also made its way into the King James Version, even though uh, it was not in Erasmus Greek New Testaments. It was from the Vulgate. Also, the other uh, mistake that he made was in 1 John 5, 7, where it reads uh, about the heavenly witnesses, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Now, that didn't occur, that, that was not in the Greek manuscripts that he had. And the story is that Stenica uh, came to him and told him, look, it's in the Latin, therefore that needs to be in your Greek New Testament. And Erasmus said, well, there are no uh, Greek manuscripts which have it. And he said, if you can find any Greek manuscript that has that writing in it, I'll put it in. Well, sure enough, shortly after, or sometime after anyway, he brought him a manuscript, and there it was. Uh, that verse was included in it. Well, I've heard about that story for many years, and so I wanted to see if I could verify uh, all of that, because I'd understood that in the actual Greek manuscript, it's like someone put a little carrot in there and wrote it up at the top, and so I wanted to see that. So I made a trip special uh, to Ireland in Dublin at the Trinity uh, University who had that manuscript, and so they very graciously, when I got there, I told them what I wanted to do. They brought this thing out to me, laid it before me, and let me uh, go through it myself, and sure enough, as I found that statement, I was... Uh, it was included in there, but it wasn't as if it were a carrot. It was actually a part of the text. And so it, it really was in that manuscript. It's never been found in another Greek manuscript, although it is in Latin, in the Latin Bible. And so they, most everyone thinks that it was done in 1520 uh, by someone who probably hurriedly made that manuscript just so it would be included. At least that's the theory. We don't know exactly where it came from or anything, but it is a bit suspicious that uh, he did find one after Erasmus had promised that he would put it in if he could find it. So uh, the three editions of Erasmus were extremely important, and in the, uh, he did it, another one in 1527, and he did another one in 1535. And in 1527, there was about 127 or 117, I believe it was, differences between his first one and the 1527 edition. The difference between the 1527 and the 1535 were very, very small, so it didn't make uh, much difference in, in that edition. But now, pretty much the Greek New Testament text was solidified. In those days, they didn't think in terms, well, is that word exactly the same as this word? Uh, do we need to do textual criticism? To them, when they found a Greek New Testament, whether it's on manuscript or whether it's printed, that was God's word. They didn't think in terms of critical thinking like we do, is every single word the same? And so textual criticism was not yet born. A Greek New Testament was a Greek New Testament. Erasmus was the first. Nobody really raised the question. Well, what, whether, uh, did not raise the question whether or not uh, it was uh, really the accurate one from the most accurate manuscripts. And so uh, we move on from that. Uh, by this time, in 1535, you'll recall historically, that that's in England, that's when Henry VIII is uh, having his uh, uh, um, uh, squeeze with uh, Anne Boleyn, and uh, all of that uh, fiasco is going on. So they're more inter interested in theology than they are in the Greek New Testament and whether or not it is actually the, the same text as uh, one manuscript versus the other. Now, in 1546 and 1549, Robert Stephanus began to make a Greek New Testament. Uh, they all wanted to get in on the market, probably. Uh, Stephanus was a very careful printer, and he printed some small editions. And then in 1550, Stephanus printed a very large folio edition of the Greek New Testament, and it became a standard. And even today, when you talk about the Textus Receptus or the Byzantine text, you think almost immediately of Robert Stephanus's 1550 folio edition. Uh, I was always surprised when I, uh, I bought a 1550 edition, and when I got it, I discovered that it belonged to, to the uh, chaplain 
of the Queen of Navarone, uh, and that was always a, a, a mystery of uh, how uh, that came about. Uh, so the 1550 was a very important addition, and it, again, helped to solidify the same text that Erasmus used because there were very few differences between them. Then in 1551, one year later, Stephanus did a smaller edition, and this one he inserted verse divisions. The first time we have verse divisions in a Greek New Testament came with Robert Stephanus in 1551. You can see a copy of one of those over in the, in the uh, Dunham Museum as well. Uh, that was not the first Bible to, uh, to have verse divisions, a 1528 edition of a Latin uh, version had verses in the margins, uh, but they didn't stick. The ones that were put in by Stephanus did stick, and those are the same verse divisions that we use today. And you'll hear preachers or teachers in your Bible classes sometime tell you, well, the verse division, the verse is really not in the right place here, uh, and uh, that's very possible. They seem to be almost random. Uh, they say that uh, Stephanus was riding from Paris to Geneva on a horse, and the story is that every time the horse bounced, he made a, a mark for a, para, uh, a verse division, and so that's sort of the way it is. I doubt that that happened, but it makes for a good story anyway. So that was the first time, and those same verse divisions came in the Geneva Bible, and they're the same ones that we have today. It's almost impossible to change that, some paragraph Bibles attempt to make it better, uh, and you'll find divisions like in commentaries. They will, when they split up, you'll see that they'll have, they'll go from the ending verses to a first couple verses of the next chapter. Even the chapter divisions are different, although they were there since the 13th century. So Stephanus uh, did a great deal in establishing, again, the Greek New Testament. The, uh, after Stephanus, then the next one that really had a very important uh, influence on what text we use today was Theodore Beza. Uh, Theodore Beza uh, began, a Greek, uh, began his Greek New Testament in 1565, and it went a long ways towards standardizing again and making popular that particular Greek text. Again, it's a text that's based on five manuscripts that Erasmus had with a few, a few additions that came from the Computation Polyglot, but it's basically a very small number of texts. Now, if you were to choose of that period any other five manuscripts, chances are it would have been the same manuscripts because 80% of all known Greek manuscripts today represent that same group. So it's, but it's a, it's a narrow, uh, narrow readings that were favored by the majority of manuscripts, but not by the oldest manuscripts. So Theodore Beza really uh, increased that by having five major divisions. He did one in 1565, 1582, 1588, and 89, and 1598. In fact, it's the Beza Greek New Testament that was used by the King James uh, translators in 1611 when they did the famous authorized version or the King James version. Now, we know pretty much that that's the text that they used, and one of the evidences for that is that in Luke 2.22, it reads, and when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, her is the word. Uh, no manuscript evidence in Greek has her. It does occur in Latin, and it does occur in... Uh, it only occurs in Latin, but not in the Greek manuscripts, and Beza included it into his, and that has come out in the King James Version. Therefore, the King James Version probably used Beza's text, uh, and it would have been the most recent one anyway in 1598. Some say it would, may have been the 1589 edition. Uh, it's, it's almost impossible to tell which one of those, uh, but it probably was Beza as opposed to using an actual text of Stephanus or Erasmus. So the impact then of the Beza editions was it really popularized the text and it became known then uh, for all of the ones that were to follow, all the other editions that were to follow. The next important one is, was done by the Elsevier uh, boys. Uh, one was named Bonaventure and uh, his nephew Abraham 
although some say they were brothers, they were actually cousins. Uh, one was a nephew, I guess uh, it is. And in 1633, they produced a Greek New Testament that had the famous Textus Receptus reading, which said, and I, I said in English, universally accepted text free of alterations and corruptions. So uh, by putting that in their introduction, they virtually were saying, this is the edition. Well, you know, if this is the edition, that's the one you want to buy. And of course, they were very successful as printers. Now, they were careful printers because in their first edition of 1624, they did a very nice job. They made a very, very nice edition. But this one in 1633 used that word textus receptus, and that stuck. And so today you'll hear people say the Texas Receptus is Stephanus. No, it's Elsevier, uh, which was many years after uh, the Stephanus, although the text themselves vary very little. So the 1633 edition is called the Texas Receptus today. Now we still are in a period where people don't see textual criticism as, as important at all. Whatever Greek New Testament you have, Whatever manuscript you have, they consider it to be the Word of God. That's not all bad. Uh, we pick up our English Bible today, and we say, this is God's Word. And yes, we can say that, this is God's Word. Uh, and that's the way they did. Uh, they just believed that this was uh, the text. No one really thought in terms of, well, maybe this word should be here, this phrase should change here. Uh, that was not a part of their vocabulary. In 1675, 1675, which is more than 40 years after 1633, you have uh, Fell's New Testament. And John Fell began the process of textual criticism. Uh, he began to classify readings of one to the other. And then in 1707, a man by the name of Mills produced a, a very fine work of textual criticism and uh, we call this the age of manhood for textual criticism. Uh, he used the 1550, but he used other languages uh, to, help, uh, to help correct the text. He used the Coptic. He used some of the Syriac, some of the church fathers, and other editions, and began to say, now, which one is the right text? So we ha really have the beginning of textual criticism. And then you have Wittstein, who... Uh, uh, printed an edition in 1751 and 1752. So for you collectors, these are good editions that you should have, and you can always ask uh, uh, Dr. Lachman on which ones uh, uh, he might have for you. Uh, that's a little commercial that I uh, do not charge for. Uh, so uh, we have uh, Wettstein, who uh, really began to in in improve on this, and then Griesbach in 1775 through 1806, we have uh, really the advancement of the idea of families of manuscripts. They began to find that here's a family of manuscripts, here's a family of manuscripts, now how do these relate? So that today, we actually have three major families of text. We have the Byzantine family, we have the Alexandrian family, and we have the Western family. Some see a Caesarean family, but today I think most textual critics have dismissed that as more of a... Of a combination of some of the others. So at least we know there are three families. And this was beginning back with Griesbach. And then we have Tischendorf. Uh, you've probably heard of him. He was the one that discovered the famous Sinaiticus manuscript, which is uh, done about 350 uh, AD and is one of the most important manuscripts that we have today. And that was found by uh, Constantine Tischendorf down at Mount Sinai. And it's an interesting story. He rescued it because the story goes, and we don't know for sure if it's true, uh, but he claims that uh, the monks were using these manuscripts to light their ovens. And so they were tearing out pages, lighting the ovens, and he saw that, and he rescued them and uh, ended up with them. They have a different tale to tell. Uh, they believe that he was dishonest in how he got a hold of that, but it's a long story. But, but Tischendorf was important because his work was a, a very large one. It's, it's called the Eighth Edition, and it is still uh, useful today. And he began to use a lot of different manuscripts. Now we come to the, the most important person, I think, in textual criticism, and his name is Lachman, uh, Carol I. Lachman, 
who published a small edition in 1831. It's just a very small Greek New Testament. There's no indication of what it is, but he made a giant step. And that giant step in more than, in, see, it's about 200 years after uh, uh, the, uh, the establishment of the Texas Receptus. 200 years later, he was the first one to dare to take what he believed to be alternate readings and actually incorporate them in the text. Before this, whenever they found something that they believed was a true reading that should be there, they put it in the margin and made a notation, and down the margin it said, this one would be better in that particular place. He took the step by saying, no, I'm not going to do it in the margins. I'm going to take the ones that I believe are correct and place them into the text. He's the first one to abandon it. He did not mention anything about his theory except at the end where he talks about where he made some changes. In his later edition of 1842, he has a whole section dealing with what his theory is in textual criticism. But this was a very important move and I think it was a, a fatal one. I wish he had never done that because to me, we still need to be using a Greek text that is, was used by somebody. The Greek text we use today is a compilation of all of the readings and people have chosen which ones they think are the best readings. So it's very much an eclectic text. I wish we were stuck with the text, have all the variants on here and let me decide on how I felt about these various texts and use my theory whatever that might be, to choose that. But anyway, uh, for better or for worse, most people say it's better, so I'll take a back seat and uh, let you decide for yourself. Me against thousands of others, I mean, uh, what's the choice? So, uh, Lachman uh, began that process of uh, putting in the text. Probably the most important uh, textual critic of the 19th century would have been Westcott and Hort. Uh, Westcott and Hort uh, had a theory in which they believed that the families were the ultimate way in which you could reach back to find a neutral text. And uh, even though today uh, many of their, much of their theory has changed and most people won't take it exactly as it is, although we still use the families a lot in textual criticism, but their attempt was to put a text, and most of it was Alexandrinus, which is called Codex B and most believe that it is the best of all of the ancient manuscripts, about 325 or 350, which uh, is today in the Vatican. And so most people believe that's the best text, and uh, so did Westcott and Hort, although they use some textual critical things when you come right down to it. It's almost a text of Vaticanus. But they wanted to use, make a Greek text which they could give uh, and use in Bible colleges and, and, and universities uh, a text that they could act, uh, students could actually use. And that, of course, is a good thing. Um, whether or not his uh, theory held up for years to come, nevertheless, it was a very valuable move. And we've moved away from that, but it still is a very important text for today. So that's kind of basically a survey of where we have gone from the early centuries where we have the manuscripts that were given until today when we are in full-blown textual criticism. Today, the argument, there are arguments for a legitimate text that underlies the King James Version, and that's called the Textus Receptus, which is the same text of Erasmus, and there are arguments why that is not as good because it's based on, uh, it's based on more text but later text, whereas modern textual criticism likes to accept the older manuscripts and the older papyrus. And so we have a lot of information today that we can work back and forth and try to decide uh, which one is best. Uh, I might just give you a, a, a sampling of, of where we have uh, a lot of the, the, uh, the geographical distribution of the books of the Bible. Do you know where they all ended up? Uh, in Asia Minor, for instance, also called Anatolia, or today uh, Asia Minor is Turkey. Uh, you have uh, the Gospel of John. You have Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians. 1st and 2nd Timothy, Philemon, 1st Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, and Revelation. That's a total of 12 books ended up in Turkey. That's where they, they were the recipients of the originals. Greece received 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Philippians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and Titus, uh, that was at Crete, and that, that's six. You have Rome received Mark and Romans, uh, that's two. 
Uh, Luke and Acts and 2 Peter may have been sent either to Asia Minor or Rome. Matthew and James, either Asia Minor or perhaps Palestine. Uh, Hebrews in Rome or Palestine. Uh, so there's, but there's no evidence that any of the originals ended up in, uh, in Alexandria, Egypt, which is very interesting to me because there was a large Jewish community there, and very early uh, it began to be uh, a Christian community uh, grew up there very rapidly. So you see you have three areas. You have the Western text, which was Latin, uh, and then you have uh, uh, the Asia Minor, Turkey, which was Greek. Greece and Turkey were Greek. And then you have Alexandria, where it became Coptic. And so you have these three different families in three different locations. And the question is, which we still haven't unraveled yet, which I believe is important, is what is the relationship of these three together? Were these local texts that were growing up in these various areas? What kind of uh, interaction did they have among each other? And so I think that's important when we talk about textual criticism. Uh, how, can, we, can we trace the history of the text? If we can ever unravel that, we probably will uh, have solved many of the problems. Uh, again, today uh, there are basically two different uh, types of textual criticism. One is based upon what we call the, text, the, uh, the uh, received text or the Textus Receptus, the Byzantine text, uh, and that's the one that underlies the King James Version. And then we have the critical text, which is Metzger and Black and many of these men and um, uh, Aland who hold that it's the critical text because it's based on the older ones. And those are the two basic systems. Most today hold to the critical text, that that's the best one because it's based on the older text. Others say no, the Byzantine family or the textual, uh, textual receptus. It's interesting that uh, as I've uh, been working on the King James Version and the people who, uh, who did the King James Version uh, translated it, there are many, many very, very outstanding Greek scholars that worked on that translation. And so I believe the translation itself was a good one. Uh, I have to say that today it's, uh, it's pretty difficult uh, for many people to understand. For instance, uh, we don't exactly use a superfluity of naughtiness anymore, uh, but that's a text that, that's one that's used by the King James Version. So I believe that uh, we should be making modern translations. I think that's important. We have many, many, many of them, and uh, Bill Paul can tell you how many there are. There's hundreds of them that have been made since the turn of the 20th century, and I think that's good. Uh, a colleague of mine once said that if you, if you read six modern translations, you probably have equivalent to the original. I don't know if I'll go that far or not, but that's, uh, that was his view, that uh, they're not going to hurt you. I always tell the story about uh, my own experience with a very liberal translation uh, uh, that is a, more of a paraphrastic translation. When I was in seminary, we were taught, you know, you know Greek and Hebrew, and you use the most literal translations you can because they're the most accurate. They represent the text better. And uh, until uh, one day I came to my home in, in Illinois, I drove up from Texas to Illinois, and uh, my father was there. My father always carried an a, a, uh, English Testament in his side suit pocket. He'd go to church, open it up, or, or probably leave it in there, come home at night, take it out, or after church, come home, lay it on the dresser, and there it stayed until the next day. And I came home this particular time uh, at a vacation, and uh, my father uh, had only graduated from eighth grade. And so he said, have you ever heard of good news for modern man? And I said, oh, yeah, I know about that. And he said, well, you know, someone gave, one to, gave it to me. And he said, I started reading that. And he says, for the first time, I realized that the Bible is something that you, sh you can understand. I was absolutely flabbergasted. I could not believe what I'd heard. But... It was a Bible that he could read because he just was not educated enough. And yet now all of a sudden he realized that, God, that God's word was for him. He could read it on his own. He didn't have to go and hear a pastor explain it to him. And so it really changed my view. As I always say, my heart was strangely warmed uh, because now I knew that there's, these translations have a reason and a purpose. And if you know what that reason and that purpose is, uh, these translations are very, very good, and uh, read them, 
and evaluate them for yourselves, uh, but uh, be sure to use them. I always say that two, uh, you know, after a student has w learned one or two years of Greek, he knows just enough to be dangerous, uh, and you're probably better off to use English after you've had a, one or two years of Greek than, than to uh, try to translate all that yourself and make decisions. So anyway, that's, that's the way it is. Well, my time is up. Uh, if you have a quick question or two, I'd be happy to see if I can answer it. I know I threw a lot of things at you and a lot of dates and everything, but yes? Uh, excellent question. My great fear always is that we get into textual critical issues and we, it, it raises doubts on the Bible. Uh, you know, again, if you, the, the differences in these texts are really, really minor. You know, the major difference between the two texts, the largest difference is the last few verses of the Gospel of Mark, 16, 9 through 20, I believe. That's the largest. There's another one in John, uh, John 7, 53 through 8, something, 2 or 3. Those are the largest differences. A lot of times it's just a matter of, of a them or a his or something like that. They really do not make a difference on the confidence that we have in the scriptures. What I have found is that the more I've studied this, the more confident I am that what I read today is the same as what was given to the original apostles. So my, my strength is greater, but that's a fear I have that we get so involved in these te technical things that we begin to say, well, wait a minute, how can we know which one is right or wrong? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, there's, uh, there's a lot of theories about the, the, the last verses of Mark. There are about three different endings that have been proposed as possible endings for Mark. Uh, that one's is not particularly a good one, but you're right. Uh, Jerome, Jerome had a reading somewhere. Uh, some suggest, for instance, like in 5-7, that that is such a clear statement of the Trinity that the Roman, the Roman Catholic Church may have wanted, or the, not the Roman Catholic Church at that time, but the translators at that time may have wanted to clarify to make sure that people understand that the Trinity is three in one. They may have added that without a manuscript uh, evidence. We don't know that. All we know is what is there. So, uh, but you're right. It may be that there, those manuscripts simply have perished, and we don't have them in the earlier manuscripts that came from Alexandria. Uh, and it may be represented by the, the Byzantine family. Which was? Yes, yes, it's in Latin. Yeah, I don't know that. I don't know. I don't know old Latin. Jerome's Latin it was, but I don't know what the, I have not, yeah, no, I don't know that. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, there's not much difference there, but probably not Erasmus 1516. If anything, it would be Erasmus 1527 or 35. That would be closest to the 1550. But when we say Texas Receptus, that really refers to the 1633 edition that was done by the Elsevier brothers because that's where the term Texas Receptus uh, came into being. But it's so close that we commonly call the Texas Receptus Erasmus, we call Stephanus, and we call the Elsevier.
because the, the differences there are, are just minute, minute. But the 1516 is the worst of the three. They improved on it in his other editions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.